The point is I took creative license with this, with this community because as an art major for my undergrad degree, I've continued to be inspired by the visual arts and to incorporate references to drawing, painting, and carving in my writing. So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of my areas of interest and then I'll read some short passages from Lost Mountain and you'll see how salmon come in. So I completed um, my BA from the University of Washington in the early 80s. Mostly I did drawing and painting, uh, but one of my classes was a wood carving class taught by Marvin Oliver, a uh, Quinault Indian. We learned how to make spoons from a full round of birch. And later when I moved back to Alaska, I started carving masks. One of those ended up as the cover image of my first poetry chapbook, Undated Passages. This mask is at the lake and I don't have a digital image of it. So this is the best I can do. Um, the real art object is not a double mask. I just duplicated it for the cover of my book. I also took a basket making class from Rita Blumenstein who was from Nelson Island and I came to fully appreciate the art of Yupik basket making. As you can see, my attempts at the art form were unimpressive and this was never completed. But after that experience, I understood the craft in a way that I never had before. I'm sure you've all seen some of the gorgeous brass baskets made by Alaska Native women. In the 1990s, I took a poetry class at UAA. I'd always been interested in poetry, but I'd never explored it. And I ended up enrolling in the MFA program and earned my degree in creative writing. A Measures Hush is one of my three full length uh, poetry collections, but there's a section of the book that includes poems about art. One of the poems was inspired by the image on the front cover of the book, and it's a Yupik Eskimo mask from St. Michael. So this is all background to explain why Lost Mountain is centered around the arts. The community of Whetstone includes, guess what? A mask carver, a painter, a basket maker, and two jewelers, um, a man and wife, plus a few other artists. Delia Melvin is one of two main characters. Um, she's the mask carver, but the excerpts I'm going to read don't show her at work. So part of the artist's assignments as residents of Whetstone is that they have to give presentations for the tourists who come to visit. And the basket weaver is a Yupik woman named Dolly Monroe, and in this passage, she's demonstrating her craft. Alan is the other main character, but he's not an artist, he, but he's in this scene and, um, and watching. So this is a Bethel woman at work on a basket. I just thought it would be nice for you to have a visual while I read the passage. Dolly picked a blade of grass from a pan of water, split it lengthwise with her fingernail, then threaded it into a large eyed needle. She began sewing, working counterclockwise, adding clusters of grass to form the basket's coil. Loop over loop over loop, Alan admired her patience. She worked without speaking for 10 minutes. Then she came to a figure in her basket, one of several motifs. A wolf, Dolly said, and here is a raven, here is a caribou. She explained that the theme of the basket was relationships. In this case, how ravens led wolves to the grazing animals who gave them, themselves up to the wolves, who in turn left scraps of meat for the ravens. Everything is connected. If one thing is disturbed, it upsets the balance, the circle of life. Alan glanced at Carolyn. Had she heard Dolly's words? If one thing is disturbed, it upsets the balance, the circle of life. But Carolyn was bent over a notebook. This next scene takes place when Delia goes to visit her friend, Barbara. Uh, Barbara is the painter. And keep in mind that this is a love story inspired by the Pebble Mine Project, so salmon and fishing pay, play a big role. At this point in the book, many of the characters have expressed their opposition to this huge development project, which is referred to in the novel as the Fly Creek Mine. The company behind it is um, Ziggurat Inc. Why Ziggurat? Well, I couldn't call it Northern Dynasty, but um, I remembered from my art history classes these Mesopotamian temple ziggurats, and they're basically pyramid shaped, but they have uh, steps or terraces cut into the sides. 
And I thought there was a parallel between dynasties and ziggurats because there's something grandiose about what they represent. And ziggurat is great because it's visual. So my character, Barbara, creates this multimedia work that incorporates the image of a ziggurat as the inverse image of Lost Mountain onto this pristine lake. The residents of Whetstone subsistence fish for salmon, so that's why the salmon net is included here. And I like this idea enough that I commissioned the painting from Beth Hill of Kakanak, hoping it might end up as book's cover. Um, it didn't make the cover, but it's in the interior, and I'm really happy with that. So here's the passage from the book when Delia stops by to visit Margaret near Christmas time. The room was in fact hardly festive. There were no decorations, just a dozen cards lining the windowsills. Against the far wall leaned the usual stack of paintings, some complete, others works in progress. But the corner easel held a new canvas the size of a large thrill rug. In the upper third, a mountain contrasted against a deep blue sky, and at the bottom, matte board cutouts glued over a wash of violet black outlined an upside down pyramid. If Barbara meant to depict Lost Mountain, she had distorted it, changing the ridge line, giving it more of a volcanic look, and moving it right down to the water for dramatic effect. What are you working on? Barbara stood tall and squared her shoulders. I'm using mixed media and found objects. She pointed to the middle of her painting. This is Lake Elaine. Lifting a piece of old gill net from the floor, she draped it, lead line intact, over the water. It'll look like this when it's done. I'm calling it the marriage of heaven and hell after Blake. Blake, providing inspiration for Patricia and maybe Julie and now Barbara? Not Blake Parsons, William Blake, the painter. I stole the title from him. An Egyptian theme? You don't see it? Delia didn't. It's not a pyramid, said Barbara. It's an upside down ziggurat. Isn't that fascinating how it looks like an open pit? As soon as Barbara said it, the resemblance was clear. Ziggurat, the Fly Creek mine, there it was again. And she'd only come to share some holiday cheer. I mentioned that uh, Delia and Alan are the two main characters. Alan's job in Whetstone is to install solar panels for the community. He's also the guy who falls in love with Delia. But in this scene, he's walking uh, um, down one of the paths in Whetstone, which are named after precious stones. I had this idea that Whetstone's 16 parcels are laid out like facets on an oblong gem. And the trail names include things like garnet, sapphire, agate, and emerald. So I thought this photo of the lake was appropriate since this is about gemstones. So here's Alan. He passed tourmaline. Tourmaline, was that a rock or a gemstone? He would no idea if it was used in jewelry. Probably not, since it wasn't commonly known, not like jade or emerald or ruby. Who made these decisions anyway about how precious a stone was? the rarer and more durable, the more valuable, but that didn't always translate into beauty. What was so attractive about a diamond for pure looks? A tiger eye or star sapphire was a lot more intriguing. So this notion of how we assign value to gems leads into the last excerpt I'm going to share. Uh, this is with the jewelers I mentioned, and it takes place at a hearing when people come up to testify before a panel of lawmakers. And this time, Delia is in the audience watching. I'm Bryce Peterson, and this is my wife, Jen. We're testifying as one. We've been jewelers for 15 years. We've made earrings, necklaces, bracelets, the works, mostly gold. When we heard about this mine, we thought, great, of course, we're in the business. But we know more now. For a porphyry mine, it takes thousands of tons of crushed ore to get one little ring. And 80% of all mined gold goes to jewelry, 80%. Jen picked up the thread. Humans love to adorn themselves. We wear shiny things, things that glitter. From now on, Bryce and I will make jewelry from natural objects, beach stones, driftwood, and best of all, salmon. Yes, dried vertebrae and gill plates, they're beautiful. Today, we're starting a pool. We're going to make a gift. Do you see these rings? They held up their left hands. Our wedding rings, solid gold, we're giving them up. 
Jan lifted an old gold pan from the table and she and Bryce dropped their rings into it where they landed with two resonant pings. We welcome donations. We'll be giving the proceeds to fight this mine. Delia's vision cleared. My wedding ring, what value does it have now lying under a towel in a closed drawer? So I did make these earrings in the photo and I want to share this story with you. I was walking on our beach at Lake Clark one day and I picked up some salmon bones and I realized they could be turned into beautiful jewelry. So that's how it ended up in my novel. And then during the course of my many revisions, yes, many, <laughs> um, I learned about Rika Mao's work and I thought, wow, what a coincidence. Here's someone actually working with these materials. It was a wonderful moment. And before I go, I want to thank Bristol Bay artist Abaya Kamor for her incredible paintings that advocate for salmon and protection. This is one of my favorites. I know there are many other artists out there who do work um, that celebrate salmon, so thanks to all of you. And I'll just say, uh, I'll end by saying that advocacy comes in many different forms. I do believe that art can influence us. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's overt, but I would love for art to, and literature to assume a more prominent role in our environmental discussions. And uh, when this event is over, please don't forget to hop over to the Stop Pebble Mine Now website and sign the petition because we still need the EPA to use the 404C to kill the project completely. I'm going to turn it back over to Chanel now so she can introduce Rika. Thank you, Anne. And thank you for calling for protections once again. Um, I am going to drop some links in the chat as well so that you can see more of Anne's work <laughs> um, and check out her book so you can <laughs> like continue the conversation. Um, I also want to note that you can ask questions in the chat. I'll be collecting them and we'll address them at the end in the order that they show up. With that, next up is Rika Mao, <laughs> our real life story storybook artist from Homer. Um, <laughs> Rika is coming from a jewelry making practice and has long explored themes of connectivity in the natural world. Since Pebble's efforts to mine in the Bristol Bay watershed, she no longer works with metal and she now uses gathered natural materials that speak to environmental issues. Salmon vertebrae is one material that she's been working with for two decades. Go ahead and take it away, Rika. Well, thank you, Chanel. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Alaska Center. Am I showing through? Um, your presentation isn't on yet. Okay. Hmm. I'm sorry for that. We've all had technical difficulties <laughs> during this Zoom time, <laughs> but we can hear you and we can see you. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> They're all having problems. I am sorry here. We're like a few minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> so please, audience members, have a little bit of patience as we go along. All right. We're seeing your screen. Okay. Now? Yes. Great. Affirmative. <laughs> Thank you, Chanel. <laughs> thank you, the Alaska Center, for hosting this. And I want to thank all of you in attendance for showing up. This is great. I am deeply grateful to live in Tuget, the place name for Homer, as named by the Denina long ago. Tuget is located on the north coast of Ketchumac Bay and within today's tribal lands of the Nanilchik village tribe, whose descendants trace their roots from the ancient Ketchumac peoples and the Denina and Supiak people of this region. I am deeply grateful for and acknowledge their stewardship of these lands for thousands and thousands of generations. My mind travels now to the Bristol Bay watershed where the Yupik, Denina, and Aleuctic people have stewarded those lands for millennia 
and are now through the United Tribes of Bristol Bay, very actively working to protect their lands and waters from the destructive harm of industrial mining. I express my deep commitment to resisting exploitation of landscapes and waters for private profit by advocating for their protection, allying with indigenous artists and supporting indigenous led practices. Growing up, I was one of those very lucky kids that was surrounded by nature and got to spend most of my waking hours outside. Nature was and still is my most comfortable and most assuring place to be. It is a source of solace, inspiration, and a place of safety for me. This is the very beach my husband and I live on. What we four artists are presenting is our deep connection with water, life-giving sacred water. We know that fresh, clean water is more precious than gold. Whether others understand or accept it, fresh water is quite limited on this beautiful, precious earth. Now more than ever, all of us need to be water protectors. It is in our blood and it is of life itself. The works I share with you are focused on this subject and of course the salmon we all love. Everything is connected and interwoven in this wondrous tapestry in which we live. It's ironic to me that I have had a history of using precious metals in my previous art making and it took the pebble mine prospect for me to question the materials I was using. I even considered my work then as somehow honoring nature, like with this sterling silver 22 carat and gold leaf birdbath ring using a mussel shell as the holder of water for birds to drink. Now I only use gathered natural materials around me and my goal is to give voice to nature through these materials. A big part of my practice is in the actual gathering process. I love the gathering part. I love being outside, especially in natural landscapes. I love focusing on and searching for particular materials that give voice to a landscape or a specific subject matter. For me, it is a time of being totally present and of listening to what is immediately around me. Here on these 18 by 18 inch painted wooden panels, I've assembled mussel shells that have long been buried and then washed up as eroding storm berms reveal them, the outer blue shell worn off, revealing their lustrous mother of pearl inner shell. As filter feeders, mussels play an important role in their aquatic ecosystem. The assemblages evoke the textures of the water from which they once lived, the water currents, the wind, schools of salmon, birds in flight, and even the watersheds that feed into the ocean. These panels are titled Being Watchful after a poem written by Wendell Berry. I titled this piece Red Carpet. It is a photograph of a fireweed leaf assemblage that was printed on canvas at its actual assembled size, nine feet long and two feet wide. Once photographed, I deconstructed the assemblage and saved the leaves for another project. So the physical assemblage was ephemeral. Fireweed is ubiquitous and emblematic of the summer and autumn Alaskan landscape. I made this piece having been inspired during a residency in the Denali National Park. While my intent was to speak of the road that exists in the park as a message to visitors using the road to be ambassadors for wild places, it was while assembling the leaves that I kept seeing them as fish and the assemblage as a richly flowing anadromous stream. Now I see this assemblage as a river where wild salmon dignitaries travel upstream to spawn. This piece is titled Lifeline. 
I love everything about wild salmon. I love their beauty. I love all the habitats in which they live and need to survive. Freshwater wetlands, peatlands, lakes, streams and rivers, forests, estuaries, and the open ocean. I love all the phases of their lives, the color of their flesh, and the brilliance of their skin. I love that they stitch fresh water to salt water and wetlands to forests. They stitch water to land and stitch people to one another and to their surroundings. They highlight huge issues of relating to land use, water quality, and the wholeness of watersheds, the health of the ocean, and the very food that feeds both humans and non-humans alike. Salmon are the backbone, blood, and lifeline for interconnected ecosystems and a way of life. Salmon are Alaska's gold keep, that keeps giving and giving. Ultimately, what is best for salmon is what is best for humans. This piece is titled Hanging by a Thread to reflect that if Pebble Mine were to ever be developed, the largest wild salmon run in the world would hang by a thread. I recall the first time I thought to use salmon vertebrae in my work. It was a couple of decades ago when spending time across Cook Inlet in an area around Chenick and Amoktadori Creeks. I came upon old dried piles of bear scat full of salmon vertebrae. I saw these naturally processed objects as beads and was amazed by their beauty. In a flash, I saw a material that spawned a new vision of work to be made and what to say with it. Ruth Bader Ginsburg's well-known judicial collar necklaces were an inspiration for my own version of judicial collars for a show titled Decolonizing Alaska. The show traveled for two years throughout Alaska and to Washington, D.C. at the Corcoran School of Arts. The Corcoran happens to be located across the street from the White House complex and coincidentally was installed a week after Trump's inauguration. It was a potent time. My callers are a call to stop the commodification of nature, the exploitation of ecosystems for private profit making. Nature must have legal rights, personhood really. Western culture has forgotten the integral connection we have with nature. Instead, it looks at nature as a resource to develop. Environmental justice is social justice. Social justice is economic justice. It is all the same and interwoven. Environmental justice upholds equity and justice for all, now and for generations to come, rather than the short-term exploitation by a powerful few. Alaskan politicians refer to Alaska as the resource state. This must stop. This collar represents the Arctic coastal plain referred to by politicians as section 1002, a section of the Arctic refuge that they see as potential for oil drilling. But this coastal plain is known by the Gwich'in as the place where life begins. The porcupine herd uses this area for their birthing grounds. This collar is made with caribou antler slices stitched to black cloth. This collar represents the Tongass National Forest where old growth yellow and red cedar is still being targeted by the timber industry. It is made with carved and stitched together yellow cedar chips carved from a log carved from a log <laughs> washed up from the ocean, washed up onto the beach. This collar represents the Bristol Bay watershed. It is made with salmon vertebrae and carved alder. Its sacred waters threading throughout the land must be protected through legal standing, recognized with personhood for its rich anadromous waters. It is possible and it's happening already with the Klamath River and Lake Erie. 
it is time to think holistically, inclusively, and indigenously. My favorite way of gathering these vertebrae is to gather up a couple of girlfriends in the spring, a special picnic lunch to share for a day of walking along the water's edge of Skelac Lake and points along the Kenai River. Together, we gather winter weathered salmon spines from the previous fall and make a day of it. It takes many, many months to clean, smooth, and size sort the vertebrae to get them to a useful, useful stage for art making. I'm now working on a tunic piece using salmon vertebrae and fish skin that speaks of salmon people and the culture around salmon. These swatches are laid out by vertebrae size so I can see how much material I have to work with. With the threat of industrialized development and climate change, we are at a point at which we have a choice to allow salmon people and their way of life to continue into the future or to destroy both salmon and those humans and non-humans whose way of life is deeply connected and dependent upon them. My intention with the completed piece is to photograph it in existing healthy salmon habitats, as well as in habitats that have been lost, like the Walmart Supercenter in Kenai, located near where the Kenai River joins the ocean and where acres and acres of salmon bearing wetlands were and continue to be destroyed. If we love salmon, we have to avert the continued Western way of exploitation and to listen to the knowledge we already have through generational indigenous ways of knowing and Western science. Art has a way of communication that reaches the mind through the heart. Its vocabulary is different. Art enters the psyche in a different way, and it is powerful. It is an honor today and a privilege to present with these three eloquent artists. Their work and their voices are powerful. I thank all the people and all the groups who are working with the focus and passion it takes to keep wild waters clean, cold, and unobstructed for salmon, for the land and for generations to come. No place in the world these days remains special by accident. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Rika. <laughs> Thank you, yes, yes, wow. <laughs> Um, I just want to say I really want to go on a salmon uh, vertebrae picnic trip with you <laughs> one day in the future. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm dropping in the chat some uh, resources, links that you can see Rika's more recent work. <laughs> and now let us hear from Annette Bellamy. So Annette works out of a studio in Halibut Cove, plays her primary medium along with fiber, steel, wood, and fish skin. <laughs> her years of life on the water, commercial fishing, and her life of making art fuel each other. Annette, are you ready to go? <laughs> I'm ready to go. Thank you, Charlene. Yeah. So I'm gonna begin my talk with showing you a picture of where I live. This is a view from my studio, my home in Halibut Cove the house and the dock and the floats. And usually our fishing boats tied up. That's my second home. I've had a second home since majority of my life that's been spent majority of my life that I've lived in Alaska. I've always had a boat to live on as well. So I like to say that one home has a table that moves and another home has a table that doesn't move. And this is a little bit different time of year too. Right now it's covered with snow, so it doesn't quite look like that. Um, I love being living on an island and surrounded by water. Of course, on the boat, I'm on the water. Okay. Home economics is the first piece I ever made with fish skin. It, uh, these are sections of columns 
that are six to eight feet tall. They spread across a 16 foot wall. There were 11 columns. And these were a journal of our meals of fish from September to March. They were exhibited um, after, in memory of Fran Reed. She shared her knowledge of fish skin sewing sh shortly before she died. And we decided to have an exhibit in memory of Fran. So as I sewed these skins, Working towards this exhibit, I thought, gosh, all of my years of fishing had been about 36 years of fishing when I started sewing fish skins. I thought this is a medium that tells a story like no other story can. The predominant meal was salmon and all the fish was caught on our boat with care, um, put on our table. Home economics is about a different value system. It's about locally sourced food and community and sustainability. The next large fish skin piece that I made was out of water. I had the opportunity to have a solo exhibit at the Anchorage Museum and I made this quilt form using the fish skin. It was a um, homage to the years that fish have sustained us. The butterfly skins in the top center are chum salmon that I canned for winter. The lower left and right hand corner is Chinook salmon, king salmon. All the other species um, were five species of salmon there's halibut, yellow eye rockfish, ling cod, uh, Pacific gray cod, sable fish. I think that's it, but all the bycatch from long lining along with um, salmon gill netting uh, catch. And once again, caught on our boat. And also we ate all this fish. I had to give up eating the skin, but um, it's a, uh, yeah, the patches that I have when I tear the skin accidentally as I'm scraping it and cleaning it, I put a patch on there that was very apparent because I wanted to show the care and the repair of the fish. This was in 2013 and the exhibit was titled floating. You can see out of water at the fall at the far wall and then there's floating, the number of small boats hung and then there's sinkers. And this really, this is a point where I'd fished for 41 years when I had this exhibit. It really was uh, reflections on my years of fishing that obviously inspired a lot of my work and my love of the water and yeah. And the overview of floating uh, reminds me of how when you look in a stream and leaves are floating down a stream, they have the shadows that go to the you know, bed of the stream, but these are very small boats, maybe six to eight inches hung in the center. So they do have a lot of movement from just the air current in the gallery. And there were, was 14 foot long, three levels of boats and they would be moving and very delicate. But as I hung this and made this work, I was thinking about all the weather I've been in in the fishing, you know, and, and the weather comes up and the ocean is just so powerful. It makes me realize how small we are in the face of nature. Yet, um, even on a flat calm day, there's a movement in the ocean. It's like the ocean's breathing. But as powerful as the ocean is, it is very fragile and its fragility is becoming more um, obvious every year. We can't use the ocean as a dumping ground. We need clean water. It's uh, very precious. This is an overview of sinkers. It's a yin and yang of the exhibit. Sinkers is hung on obviously heavier lines to hold the weight and sinkers is about what anchors us, what holds us down, and finally about what's lost to us. Fish fingers, I never thought about this until I saw the image of the work after it was photographed, but fish fingers is kind of like a wall of usics, but it's about my life as a fisherwoman and these are working hands. They're my fingers being held up saying, pay attention. Each finger represents one year of my fishing. This exhibit was in 2016. And um, they're full of patches and they're gnarly. My hands show, you know, definitely either in the water or in clay in my studio. But um, there's also an intended pun, um, fish fingers to the fish sticks in the grocery store. 
um, they're punched out and they're just perfect. And these fingers of mine aren't perfect like that, but much more interesting. It's a, it's a commentary too on the sustainability of small boat fishery versus industrial style fishing and what is actually sustainable for the, the fish. So this was in an exhibit um, that Rika also was part of called decolonization. It's the only three dimensional work that I've sewn in, in fish skin. And I, I did these wrapped around um, pieces of uh, alder because they're kind of knotty and they kind of look like my hands. I want people to look at resources differently. I want people to look at mountains differently to look, um, maybe imagine looking into a mountain and then to look at what you think is inanimate as being alive. And once again, this is a hanging piece, so it has movement and that gives it life. But um, it's a uh, 12 foot wide and it's 10 foot tall. And every time it's been installed, it's a little bit different. It's a moving mountain. It first exhibited in a solo exhibit at the State Museum in Juneau. Then it was part of an exhibit called The Map is Not the Territory at the Portland Art Museum. And each time it was moving. As you see in this close up, the variation of the clay, it uh, results from 14 garbage cans of ball milled clay that my mentor and friend, Alex Combs, gave me. Once uh, he had his hands in this clay, he decided not to fire it, he ball milled it. Then I reconstitute it, I use it, and I fire it. And the history of the hands that had been in it are there. You can't, they're, they're frozen in history after you fire clay. And it's just like the fish skin that I've sewn pieces out of. There's a memory of that material. It was caught on our boat. I remember the meals sometimes of when we had it. It has this whole kind of, it's, it's fed us. So there's a the, uh, thread that kind of runs through all of my work is this recognition of the material and the memory that it has. And this last piece I'm gonna share with you is Wood, Water and Distance. It was um, made for an exhibit, uh, Another Crossing, Artists Revisit the Mayflower Voyage. For this exhibit, I invited six Alaska Native artists to join me. Uh, Lena Amison Burns, Sonia Keller Combs, Tommy Joseph, Rebecca Lyon, Deka Zine Mayner, and Heidi Sinungatuck to collaborate with me and each making a boat that express their feelings about 400 years since the Mayflower voyage. Wood, water and distance is the collaboration that resulted um, in this invitation. And each artist made a powerful work for this collaboration. The boat that I made is here and carved out of red cedar. I must say that there is a unusual caveat to the exhibit. We had to use materials and techniques of the 17th century which I don't think is difficult for Alaskans, but um, I learned how to carve. This is carved out of red cedar. And it has a clear fur paddle inset with a lineup of bowls. And the clay was sourced from Alaska, the lower 48 in Europe. And the pots represent the use of pots through millennia in all cultures. And they form this backbone in the boat and the backbone represents the family of man and our shared space within a very fragile balance. The opening of another crossing was been delayed a year because of the pandemic. It'll open in July at the Fuller Craft Museum in Brockton, Massachusetts, and it'll travel in November to the UK and be opening at the Plymouth College of Art and the Box Gallery. Well, I've blown away by everybody's work and we all have different voices, but I think there's a line of thought and care that we all share about salmon. And it's been a wonderful opportunity to share my work with you today. And I support the Alaska Center and thank them for hosting this and hope everybody writes in about Pebble Mine. We've got to stop that. And um, yeah, 
Thank you for this opportunity to talk about my work, art and advocacy. Thank you, Annette. <laughs> this uh, event wouldn't exist without all, any of you. <laughs> so it, the ball is truly, it's like, <laughs> it's you guys, <laughs> it's you, you four. <laughs> all right, so I'm putting in the chat again, that call to action um, and Annette's website. You can visit Annette's work at AnnetteBellamy.com. <laughs> I appreciate all of your voices. <laughs> That said, let us move to uh, Lauren. <laughs> Lauren Sanford works primarily in clay as well. She's produced a number of fish and fishing related sculptures and paintings with deep roots in Alaska. Lauren commercial fishes at a family set net site near Naknek. <laughs> Go ahead and take it away, Lauren, if you're ready. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to start out by thanking Chanel and Alaska Center for hosting us, um, to Anne for recruiting me for this. Um, I, I feel really honored to be included. Uh, so my name is Lauren Stanford. I am a ceramic artist. I received my Bachelor of Fine Arts from UAA in 2018. Afterwards, I spent two winters in Mendocino, California as an artist in residence. I came home uh, for good last spring and I'm, I'm very, very happy to be home. I am also a fourth generation commercial fisherman, Bristol Bay commercial fisherman. Uh, I am a knack-knack set netter, but I also grew up subsistence fishing uh, on the shores of Lake Clark at my grandparents' homestead. I also happen to be the granddaughter of Jay and Bella Hammond. Um, I spent my summers with them. This, is a, this picture is a view of their homestead and they really instilled in me the importance of clean water, healthy fish, and um, kind of the role that salmon play in, in our life. And so my summers with them are really shaped uh, all of my artwork, whether it's fishing related or not. And, and um, right now there is a, a movement to amend the section 404 of the Clean Water Act that would establish a national fisher fisheries area named after my grandparents. And essentially it would raise higher standards that would bar mining, but also allow for fishing, hunting and uh, traditional activities in the area. And my grandparents were always speaking out against Pebble Mine. My grandmother was a very private person, but when it came to Pebble Mine, she, she stood up and she spoke her mind and did everything she could um, to stand up against the pebble mine. So uh, now that they're gone, I feel very compelled, even though my voice isn't as loud as theirs yet, um, to stand up and pick up where they left off. So like I said, I grew up um, subsistence fishing. Uh, we would set, put out a net in front of the cabin and uh, we would can and smoke sockeye salmon. And, um, when I was really little and completely not helpful, <laughs> I, I started out playing in the gut bucket at my mother and grandmother's feet. And, you know, they'd be joking and talking and listening to music as they cleaned fish. And, and so I kind of entered that world of just kind of playing at their feet. And then as we all got older and I was more useful, I started stepping in and cleaning the fish and as my and my grandmother would kind of take a few steps back and so it was kind of this transfer of this tradition in my family that uh, was really beautiful and um, catching and processing these fish is it's the main connection I have to my Yupik heritage so it is exceptionally dear to me. Like I said, I am a fourth generation commercial fisherman. I fished the very site and permit that my grandmother acquired, acquired from the state in the 50s. Uh, she thought commercial fishing would be fun, <laughs> and it is, but it is also a lot of hard work. Uh, this is a picture from a very great tide a few seasons ago. And um, fishing has afforded me a lot of opportunities to pursue my art career, and I'm, ex I'm so grateful for that. But more importantly, it ties to a history of the area of the men and women who came before me. And it has taught me a certain, it has taught me hard work and a certain resilience that really only commercial fishing can, can teach you. Um, and the fishing that I do at a set net site is, is very sustainable. 
our, our bycatcher, a few king salmon that we keep for ourselves and flounders we throw back. It is so low impact and it is a, it is a sustainable way of commercial fishing and feeding the world that if managed properly, my grandchildren's grandchildren should be able to fish this site. Um, so as a celebration of all of this, uh, especially the fact that the commercial fishing in my family has passed through from my grandmother to my mother to my brother and I, um, this is a painting I did of my mom at a moment of rest after a very good tide. Uh, She's got her gloves off and she's resting. The water is calm, the sun is out, the brailers are full. And so it is just this moment of gratitude of, of everything that we have in our, um, in our commercial fishing operation. And this is a self-portrait that uh, I start kind of exploring my own identity as a female commercial fisherman and uh, you know, there's there's moments in which you're in the, in you're fishing, and you know whether the it's the weather, the amount of fish, you're tired, you feel caught and trapped at times. You know, the the, the right hand here is caught in the net, and she's just overwhelmed with what the net and all of these fish. However, she still has one glove on her hand, and she's going to pull through. And so it is this resilience of of you just have to keep going, um, no matter what adversity you are facing. So this is a multimedia self-portrait I did. Uh, it is based on um, the Dadaist movement, which was in World War I uh, in Europe. Uh, artists used um, kind of collage and absurdist imagery to explore really dark, serious um, uh, current events. Um, so this is kind of this is me looking at all the different hats I wear as a feminine woman, but also a hardworking fisherman. And I think there's probably about five or six hands in there. And, but what it really is, is an acknowledgement of, I am all of these things. And hence this, this flow of bubbles over the entire figure, like this is who I am. And this is the acceptance of, of um, all of the hats I wear. But I consider myself a ceramic artist first and foremost. Um, I am drawn to the, the tactile quality of clay. Um, as Annette talked about her hands, you know, I'm a commercial fisherman and, and working with clay. Um, there's just this intimacy of working with your hands, whether it is commercial fishing or with clay. And clay can mimic any kind of texture or whether it is flesh, stone, metal, um, fabric, foam in this case of, of this cork line that I created. And I'm really drawn to the metaphoric process of taking something as soft and malleable. You can, you can put raw clay in water and it dissolves away, but you take this, this material and you create something, you fire and you create something that is quite permanent or at least um, a more permanent version of, of what it was before. And so I find that metaphor very powerful because I believe that with every piece I make, I have a better understanding of self that is, is very important. Uh, so this is a cork line that I made. Um, I made a plaster mold of a cork. I wove a net out of cotton fibers, a cotton string and dipped that in liquid clay called slip and arranged it and fired it into this structure. But pri I primarily work with, um, or I build solid is, is my primary means of creating sculpture these days. So this piece was one large um, solid hunk of clay and then I cut it apart, hollow it out and reassemble the pieces. And this particular piece, uh, uses a salmon head with you know a female form and um, it's this idea behind this particular piece came to me when you're completely overwhelmed with so many different things that are just eating away at you and um, and these barnacles they kind of represent or kind of look like a dress and so it's kind of hinting at this um, push and pull with with traditional femininity and this is an, a second portion to the piece in which, you know, the, all the little barnacle 
barnacles have eaten away and it's it's kind of a nod back to returning to the earth and how you dissolve and you think about the salmon they return to their home strings streams excuse me and uh, they lay their eggs and then they die and they fertilize the streams and and go back to which they came um, in many ways and this particular piece too with the glaze it reminds me of of the old canneries in Bristol Bay and that kind of crusty beauty of decay with the rust um, of the canneries and and the old uh, wooden wooden pilings. And this particular piece, uh, Rapture, was a turn in my own work um, by using a mammal as kind of a way of exploring human emotion and experience. So this is my dog. Uh, blissfully rolling in in a pile of fish guts and it is reflective of uh, my childhood where I was playing in those in the fish guts um, at my mom mother and grandmother's feet and kind of this simple beauty and simple joy of that moment of um, of just living in that moment and uh, in this particular piece I've highlighted the gills and some of the row and bright red to kind of reflect um, the vitality and life cycle of salmon in, in my family. So this is my last slide and a bit of a shameful plug if you're interested in my work and what I'm doing, my website and uh, my Instagram is, is more up to date with what I've been up to. But this particular piece for uh, C is, is a sculpture of my face and transferring um, transforming into my grandmother. And it really harkens to thinking about the future and what we leave behind. And, you know, as I said earlier, my grandparents were very vocal against the proposed Pebble project. And, you know, they kept thinking about, well, what are we going to leave our children behind? You know, what, what, what do we leave future generations? And especially looking through my work for this presentation, and my own exploration of my own identity, I can't help but wonder what kind of identity we leave our children if we take away a traditional way of life and a traditional resource such as the salmon. And that's what really breaks my heart is if we put this mine in there, we lose the salmon, we lose a way of life that has sustained people for generations. And in a generation or two, that could all be wiped out. And I believe our jobs as artists is to change of the hearts and minds of people, whether it is just creating a piece and having a conversation with one people, one person, couple people, dozens of folks. And so that is why art is so important in, in advocacy of, of having these conversations that, you know, each heart and mind that is changed that that helps build this movement. And so I again want to thank um, Chanel and the Alaska Center for having this platform for all of us to share with you our work. And I want to thank Anne and Rika and Annette for sharing their stories. And I really appreciate, appreciate everyone who is tuning in now and who watches the recording later for listening to us. And I hope that you all do what you can to think about the things that we might lose if this mind goes in. So with that, I will I will stop share and thank you. <laughs> thank you as well uh, for speaking for the heart from us. I know it's it's a lot <laughs> and I appreciate the work you've done. Thank um, you. I dropped in the chat Lauren's uh, plugs. <laughs> again, the call to action that we 65 can all take right now. Um, and I'd like to offer my closing thoughts. Uh, starting from Anne's story of love and resiliency in the face of great threat to Rika's really poignant use of salmon bones showing how salmon ties water to land to us, <laughs> to Annette's way of shining light on um, materials and memory and legacy. And then to Lauren's like exploration of intersections of indigenous feminine um, identities in fishing. <laughs> I think this art shows that we're all standing together. We stand up now to say salmon is the backbone of Alaskan lives and livelihoods. 
it's too important for us to risk. And considering the legacy of the Bristol Bay watershed, um, how indigenous people have tended and stewarded this sacred place for eons and how Alaskans have stood up to fight against Pebble for decades, we're not gonna drop the ball anytime soon. Pebble will not break ground as long as we're on this earth. When we're elders, as Lauren's last piece showed, we're gonna be able to say, we protected this place. <laughs> so today we 66 people are here to say <laughs> no to Pebble, say yes to salmon, say yes to Bristol Bay, yes to fishing and yes to our cultures. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in. <laughs> I wanna invite any folks who wanna stay on now to ask questions of the artists and of our speakers. Um, <laughs> we, so far we have one question and <laughs> we can jump right in. Um, for the rest of you, you can add it to the chat or the Q&A and again, I'll address them as they come. Are we ready? <laughs> okay, the first question is for Anne. It's from Linda. Linda asks of Anne's book, Lost Mountain, who did the cover painting? Oops, gotta unmute. <laughs> uh, the cover, I, you know, I don't know. Um, the, uh, the, the publisher's um, uh, design team found it. So yeah, I, I, I don't know who it is. I see. <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, if there's no other questions, I'm just going to read some of the comments that have come in. <laughs> because I think they deserve getting like, getting voice. <laughs> okay. Are we ready for that? <laughs> and please let me know if there's any questions that show up. Bow bow. <laughs> All right. So far, we've got, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't collecting them as we went. Um, <laughs> here from Homer at Denina Lands, some of my favorite artists are looking beautiful. <laughs> Not so much a comment on the art as a comment on y'all, but I think it's very cute. <laughs> um, and then let's see, somebody says, such a beautiful book cover. <laughs> and Lauren agrees, well, Laurel Epps agrees that it's beautiful. Um, Lisa says amazing in response to, I think some of the art you showed, Anne. Um, and Laurel Epps comments that Rika's fireweed assemblage with salmon swimming and spawning is really beautiful. Um, <laughs> Vivian appreciates the callers. Um, so does Cal Walker. And bow, bow sorry. <laughs> Maylee Hayes, Hayes uh, says there's wonderful presentations. <laughs> okay, so it looks like we have um, one question from Dorla Harness. Dorla asks if this program is shareable and available somewhere. It is live on Facebook um, and it'll stay recorded on Facebook. Uh, we can send a recording in the follow-up email as well. So watch out for your email. Bye -bye. Um, then we have a question about if Lauren has any images of individual fish uh, <laughs> that she could share. <laughs> if not, she understands. Um, I think I saw that when it popped up. I, I see you, Denise. <laughs> um, I, I don't have anything prepared of, of individual fish at the moment. I just had my slideshow. Um, but I recently set up a studio space. I see. Yeah. <laughs> Denise. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah. Um, I recently set up a, a new studio space and I'm hoping in the next few weeks that I'll start making work again. The pandemic kind of derailed all of that and ceramics is very specific in their equipment you, you have to have. So, um, I'm sure Denise has been bothered, bugging me for years about making, making her some, some clay salmon. So I'll get on that as soon as I can promise. <laughs> <laughs> <All right>. 
<laughs> Contact me when you do as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure many others would be interested. <laughs> All right. So then Lisa says, um, it's amazing how much of the emotional impact is conveyed from the museum exhibits, just from pictures. And hearing you describe the process, um, she feels like she's there. <laughs> and I think that was for <laughs> um, Mary says, I applaud your respect for the beauty found in nature. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, <laughs> Shane Mitchell says, Lauren, it's so good to see your work again. <laughs> Cow says, or Co, sorry, I, you deserve to have your name pronounced right, but I'm not getting it right. <laughs> they say, <laughs> I love the playfulness and deep thought into past, present, and future. Thank you for sharing this inspirational work. It's wonderful that commercial fishing provides you with the capacity for this work. Um, and there's a lot of other great messages. And I'm ready <laughs> to close if all of you are as well. Can, if you'd like to share any closing thoughts, you're welcome to now. <laughs> no, I, I just, I noticed that someone is asking if the links in the chat will be available. Um, yeah, we'll send them in the follow-up. Thank you for showing up email. Check your email <laughs> um, tomorrow. Well, it's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed having this opportunity. One thing I was going to add about my hanging sculptures, so I kind of didn't read my script, but I just wanted to add that the museums that have exhibited my hanging pieces, they've been challenged with like floating sinkers and moving mountain. Each one of those have usually, they seem to invite children to want to go into them because they're <laughs> moving and they'll be under them and in them, tangle lines, but I kind of like it in a way. Usually it, there hasn't been any damage, but it's, it's almost like this big different world for them. So I like that invitation that they have given out to younger people as well, the movement. I, I just have one closing comment, and I, I wrote this to Rika in one email, but it's, I mean, because of this presentation, I know so much more about you as individuals and what you're trying to do through your art. And I mean, I told Rika, I just thought they were like beautiful, you know, assemblages. I didn't know that there really was this, this, this message behind a lot of the works, and only through hearing the artists talk about their, their work do I really fully appreciate what they're doing? And that goes for all of you, so. Yeah. Well, Anne, I just bought a copy of your book, so I'm gonna start reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanna offer up space for Rika and Lauren. Rika, do you wanna say any last thoughts before the hour? Well, I've just been noticing that art is playing more and more of a role in dialogue and advocacy more and more. And I'm seeing this uh, on all levels, talking about astronomy and science and uh, all kinds of things. So it's, it's really powerful. And I think um, having learned from another previous art and advocacy program that NRDC, had um, is that it's time for all of us in this time it's so urgent that we no longer silo different um, sectors of professionals that we're all using whatever language we have to express about climate change or you know any message that it's all universal so um, thank you all for attending and art really does matter. It's as important as anything else. We're all communicators, just trying to reach each other. Yeah. Thank you. And I feel like I can't add to, Rika said it best. We're just trying to communicate and uh, get our messages across in, in, in whatever language we can. So um, I'm just gonna piggyback off that and thank you to everyone who, who listened. And again, Anne for recruiting me. I've it, this was a wonderful way to kind of get back into the arts after the pandemic kind of sidelined everything. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, everyone, all of you. All right, thank you. With that, we'll close. <laughs> I appreciate the time we've all, you've all taken to make this come together. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.